they should just toughen up in Auckland, I see. Jenny, Christchurch, what do you grow down there? Too many silver birches, and if you're going to ban anything, ban those things. Um, I think this is kind of an interesting discussion. Go around banning certain types of trees because they might fall over in a one in a hundred year storm. You it's know, not one had, in a one hundred years. Mm. The same thing's going to happen at the end of next year. That's mm. the problem. Oh, okay. But, you know, the thing is that, yes, if you've got a soft tree, as Bernard puts it, in your garden, <laughs> it's rotting, it's dying, it's whatever. You chop it down before it falls on your house or we're still a family member. Use a bit of sense. But, you know, it's not cheap to go and have a tree topped or, are you good, are you, are you, or yes well, are you good at doing that well um sort of yeah i, I get our garden <laughs> done by someone else um who will trim our olive trees and the like but you know the fact is that people have to be responsible for their own gardens and um it, but it's expensive it's an expensive yes. exercise and you don't want someone hanging out of a tree with a chainsaw calf killing themselves well, trying to chop off a branch either Gra- graham peters is the ce of the electricity networks association uh, the body for lines companies uh graham now so what are the regulations regarding trees and power lines are they sufficient Uh, Hi, Wallace. No, they're not. Uh, We have a major problem with the tree regulations. Um, About 60 to 70% of damage in storms is caused by trees. That much? Um, Yeah. Yeah. So we have these tree regulations that have been around for 15 years, and they're just not uh, working. Um, They are... The problem with them is that they are very prescriptive about around how many metres away is the tree from the line or the line from the tree. If it gets half a metre towards the line, um, then it has to be trimmed back to one and a half metres. Now, one and a half metres is not very far for fast-growing trees. I mean, they can grow two to three metres in a season. So what we would prefer to see is, at the industry is that we would, we would like to get rid of the tree regs and we would like to replace them with proper risk management where we look at all sorts of things about the tree and also the line, like, for example, the height of the tree. Uh, a tree can be one and a half metres away from a line, but it can be five metres above the line. So um, that will fall on the line. Trees, uh, branches will break off and, and, and land on the line. So, Or it could be the type of tree and is it prone to um, branches falling off or falling over. We would look at things like how important is that line, but Graham, who decides um, which tree should be cut down and not under that sort of uh, risk management mm. sort of open system? Well, that would be the lines company doing that risk assessment and working with the landowner and that, uh, through that process um, to explain that actually this is a, a, a tree that is at risk of falling on the lines. At the moment, under the tree regs, we don't have the power to do that. Um, we can only control the trees up to one and a half metres uh, away and that's that's actually quite a fraught process in doing that so we would like to see a, a changed approach so what we're asking for is that the government do what it said it would do in 2015 which is review the tree regulations and we're still waiting for that to happen all right um, we will happen uh, this year we will come back to that because uh that's a very interesting topic graham peters uh from the electricity networks association i've got to squeeze in this before we go because we had a lot of feedback about this uh yesterday um the retirement age um should it stay where it is or should it go up uh, at some stage to both jenny and and, um, Bernard, just quickly, I think it should go up, but should be uh, on uh, medical and health issues. So people who aren't are not well should D- be able to get it. Yes or no? Uh, don't know. Too hard. Right. Hey, thanks for joining us. Tonight on Checkpoint, revelations just in that 15,000 people missed out on a pilot bowel cancer screening program, far more than the 2,500 2500 initially feared. 30 have been diagnosed with cancer. At least one person has died. We'll have more on this breaking story next. Also tonight, the young guns of global politics. Jacinda Ardern meets the French president and Canadian prime minister in Paris. The standoff between Southern Response and a customer who has begun a hunger strike outside their office. Uh, Alan Bond, a former, uh, Alan Jones, sorry, a former Wallabies coach, backs Israel Folau's right to free speech. And what does the future hold for wheel clampers?
RNZ News at five. Kia ora, good afternoon. Call Katrina Bat in Aho. Twelve and a half thousand more people have missed out on a bowel screening program in Waitamata because of a mistake. The health ministry says more than 30 of those people have developed cancer. Our health correspondent Karen Brown reports. It was revealed in February that a technical error meant 2,500 Waitamata residents failed to receive invitations to be screened for the cancer as part of a pilot programme. Officials said then three had developed bowel cancer as a result and one had died. The ministries revealed today that about 15,000 people actually missed out on invitations between 2011 and last year. Initial analysis shows more than 30 of those people now have bowel cancer. The ministry says tracing people who don't have up to date addresses in a national index has been a challenge but is stressing only the pilot was affected. It says the health minister has been told and national screening will continue being rolled out. Call Karen Brownahoe. A woman who pimped out her teenage daughter and placed her sex ad on the web has been sent to prison in the first such case of its kind here. Kazmir Lata blackmailed her 15-year-old daughter into working as a prostitute and forced her to do so for 18 months until late 2016. She's been sentenced to six years and 11 months imprisonment after pleading guilty to dealing in slaves and sexually exploiting and receiving earnings from commercial sexual services provided by an underage person. In the High Court in Auckland today, the Crown Prosecutor, Natalie Walker, said it was an unprecedented case in New Zealand and was gross offending of the most exploitative kind. Lutter's lawyer, Carl Trotter, says she was deeply sorry for what she did and hoped her daughter would find it in her to forgive her one day. Justice Muir said Lutter caused long-standing, if not irreparable, damage to her daughter, but a lighter sentence was given for her guilty plea. Lutter's partner, Avnesh Singhal, has just pleaded guilty to his part in the pimping. The government has intervened, intervened to try to resolve a quake claim dispute that triggered a hunger strike. Christchurch man Peter Glasson began a hunger strike today in front of Southern Response's offices after years of fighting with the government-owned insurer. It wants to visit Mr Glasson's home with experts to assess new evidence. But Mr Glasson doesn't want this to happen as the company has already visited his property 17 times. The Minister for Christchurch Regeneration, Megan Woods, says she's asked Darren Wright from the government's residential advisory service to meet with Mr Glasson to find a solution. I've asked Darren to meet with Mr Glasson around this very specific issue of what, what can we do to allow that site visit to happen. We're at a bit of a stalemate and my priority for, as Minister is to work with Southern Response and with Mr Glasson and to see what we can do to remove that roadblock. Megan Woods says she hopes that meeting can happen in the next 24 hours. The Waitangi Tribunal has accused the Crown of unfairly negotiating the Whakatohia settlement deal with a group that did not have the backing of the whole iwi. Five of the six hapū of the Eastern Bay of Plenty iwi withdrew their support for the mandated authority last year, but negotiations with the Crown continued. The Tribunal says the Crown prioritised its political objective of concluding all iwi settlements by 2020 over a process that was fair to Whakatohia. Ngāti Ira claimant representative Te Ringahuia Hata says her hapū are overjoyed with the tribunal's findings. We're absolutely overjoyed. For Ngāti Ira, I mean, it, um, it shows we've been vindicated in every allegation of unfairness, bad faith and predetermination that was made against the Crown. Ngāti Ira claimant representative Te Ringahuia Hata. Forest and Bird has told the High Court consent to mine an area off the coast of Taranaki was approved without proper data to show how many endangered species live there. Consent for Trans-Tasman Resources to mine the area was granted by a decision-making committee in August last year. That's being appealed against this week. The Conservation Group's lawyer, Martin Smith, says hectares of Maui dolphin frequent the area and the authority was warned to be careful with the data it had as it was not exhaustive. The information may well be the best available and that indeed does not mean all information but the best available information may still be inadequate to make a decision and at that point the EPA has to line consent, favour and caution and environmental protection. Forest and Birds lawyer Martin Smith. 
The chair of a special tribunal hearing in Takaka says the application for a water conservation order for Golden Bay's underground spring is the first of its kind in the country. A bid to grant Te Waikorupupu Springs the highest protection possible attracted more than 2,000 submissions, most in support. The hearing by the Environmental Protection Authority began in Takaka this afternoon. The tribunal chair, Camilla Owen, says 15 water conservation orders have been granted in New Zealand so far, but none for an aquifer. This water conservation order application is therefore the very first opportunity to grant a water conservation protection to an underground aquifer system. So congratulations everyone, you're making legal history. Tribunal Chair Camilla Owen, the hearing is expected to run for the next three and a half weeks. It's five minutes past five. Sport, the New Zealand Breakers may have fallen victim to the NBL's free agency window after reportedly losing captain Mika Vakona to the Brisbane Bullets. Ravinda Hunia has more. Fox Sport has reported that Mika Vakona has signed a contract and will be reunited with former Breakers coach Andre Lamanis at the Brisbane Bullets. Vakona's name adds to a growing list of Breakers departures, including Kirk Penny, who retired last season, and head coach Paul Henare, who declined to re-sign. The side are also waiting to see if assistant coach Judd Flavel will return. The Breakers have confirmed Alex Pledger, Shea Ely, Finn Delaney and Tom Abercrombie for the upcoming season. The AMBL's free agency window opened yesterday, allowing players to re-sign or accept an offer from another club who can spend up to $1.3 million on players. The new Breakers coach, Kevin Braswell, has said he's already on the phone to potential new signings, but the club told Radio New Zealand today it has no comment about speculation on any player during the free agency period. Cora Vinda Hunia, Aho. The struggling Blues may be feeling worried about this week's Super Rugby derby against the Highlanders, with their injury list now pushed out to 18 players. Fullback Michael Collins has been ruled out with a broken hand and in-form lock Josh Goodhue si sidelined for a month with an AC joint issue. The Blues have only managed two wins this season to foreign teams, the Lions and the Sunwolves. That's the news. International cooperation. I certainly come away from this visit much more hopeful um, than perhaps when I went in. Climate change. In 30 years time, uh, and I'll be sitting on my rocking chair on the, on the front veranda, my grandkids will be saying, um, you know, Koro, thanks very much. Sports commentary. Well, if I can't watch it, I'm going to be absolutely lost without my rugby because it means everything to me. Full coverage, morning report with Guy Annie Spinner and Susie Ferguson weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, history revealed through the exhumation of Otago graves. And after 10, Karen Joy Fowler, author of We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves and the Jane Austen Book Club. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after Morning Report on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland to Waikato, also Coromandel and Bay of Plenty. Fine spells and isolated showers, but rain for a time this afternoon and evening with isolated thunderstorms possible about Northland and Auckland. For Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, mostly fine isolated showers. Waitomo to Wellington and Wairarapa, including the central high country. Occasional showers, but rain for a time this afternoon. Northwest gales about Wellington and Wairarapa easing this evening. Marlborough and Nelson showers clearing this afternoon and becoming mainly fine. Showers returning for a time overnight. Bola to Fiordland, periods of rain or showers with possible thunderstorms and hail today, clearing in parts of Westland tomorrow. Canterbury to Southland, mainly fine, a few showers in Southland, spreading north for a time today and early tomorrow. The Chatham Islands, cloudy periods with a period of rain tomorrow morning. It's nine minutes past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten, and thank you everyone for being with us. We're going to begin tonight with this breaking news. We're still trying to get an official response to this, but exactly an hour ago, the Ministry of Health released a media statement saying, and I quote, many more people than first thought didn't receive invitations for free bowel screening, bowel cancer screening, during the bowel screening pilot program. How many is many? Well, somewhere in the region of 15,000 people. Now, 2,500 of those people have previously been identified. Today's news adds approximately 12,500 further names to that list. The earlier and lower figure of 2,500 was reported earlier this year, but the new number is a 500% increase on that figure. 
The ministry says, and I quote, more than 30 of these people have developed bowel cancer. Uh, we understand one of those people has died. The pilot in Waitamata, Auckland, was the vanguard of a nationwide response to the country's internationally high rate of bowel cancer. We try to get someone from the Ministry of Health to speak to this on air, but Mary Bradley is the spokesperson for Bowel Cancer New Zealand, and she has the ministry's figures. They're now saying that 15,000 people have been missed and that 2,500 people have been tracked down and informed that they missed a screening and that they could um, do screening again. So, yes, the number unfortunately seems to keep rising. A pilot screening program, 15,000 people missed. Mm. Yes, it's quite alarming, really. Um, the, the government has... Well, the pilot screening uh, people did inform the government, the Ministry of Health, that they were having issues tracking down addresses numerous times over several years and their warnings were ignored, which is very, very concerning. Sorry, can you just repeat that? So the people running the screening pilot were advising yes, yes. the ministry that they weren't getting to everyone. Is that the case? Yes, that is the case, John, that there's emails that have tracked uh, between the pilot uh, screening people and the Ministry of Health that there were concerns around people getting tracked through addresses and people that uh, don't, didn't update their or don't have updated addresses are people that can't afford to go to the doctor, are people of Māori um, descent that don't necessarily uh, get to their doctor either. You know, it's an equity issue and they're the ones that, aren't, that desperately need the screening that aren't getting it. And we've been calling on the a Ministry to please get in touch with these people to make more of an effort to put more funding into it to be able to track them down. And what's been the response? They seem to have washed their hands of it, John, um, which is, you know, really sad. They're just saying, from what we understand from the Ministry, is that people need to take themselves to their doctors if there is screening available in the area and make sure their addresses are updated, which is all well and fine for people that have the time in their hands and know about it to do, but not necessarily for the people that, that we're concerned about. Mary, we were all uh, just finding out about this this afternoon. Just out of interest, when were you told that so many people had been missed in the pilot screening program? Uh, we were aware of it in around March that that, that this had happened, and we've been um, yeah we put, we've actually said that this is a concern in March, uh, mid March, um, and look, it's just been yeah trying to get people's attention to say this isn't good enough. More needs to be done. That's for sure. So what we know is that, and I'm quoting from the ministry here, about 15,000 people may have missed out. Now, this includes the 2,500 previously publicised. Those yeah. people, for the most part, have been tracked down. But it's our understanding, mm. and once again, this is all just breaking as we speak, that mm. the remaining 12,500, many of them won't know that they've been missed out. No, that's right, John. They, they wouldn't know. And, uh, you know, this, this could potentially harm their diagnosis they may now present with advanced bowel cancer and could have been caught earlier if they'd had the screening test done. So lives could have been saved. What are we to make of all of this? Because, I mean, there are two issues here, aren't there? There's the big brushstroke issue, the broader macro issue, which is bowel cancer in New Zealand, which we have a strikingly high incidence of. And there is the micro issue, which is that this is a pilot screening program to show us how we can better address the high rate of bowel cancer. It seems on the face of it to have been a dismal failure. Oh, look, no, I don't agree with that because, um, as you said, New Zealand has terrible rates of bowel cancer. We're the second highest um, cancer in New Zealand um, and it affects so many people. You know, we've got 12,000 people, um, got so many dying every year and we desperately need screening. But it does need to be done a lot better. Uh, they need, there is a review that's going to be coming out in June that the Ministry has thankfully committed to. But that needs to be a transparent process and it needs to be very thorough and from that we need to go forward and we need to continue this rollout. We're very concerned that there might be another, more delays and already the last five DHBs in New Zealand aren't going to get screening until 2021. That's in four years time. This has taken a long, long time to get screening in New Zealand. We really, really need it. We desperately need it. We've got some of the worst rates in the OECD uh, but they need to get it right and they need to get this right very, very quickly. This isn't good enough. They knew about these extra p missing people in January before the review was announced. Why were we not told then? Now, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered.
Mary Bradley, who is from Bar Cancer uh, New Zealand, we would love to talk to somebody from the Ministry of Health about this. We are making calls, but if anyone from the Ministry is listening and you are mandated to talk to us, please uh, get in touch as soon as possible. It's quarter past five. Three so-called young guns of global politics converged overnight as Jacinda Ardern met with the leaders of France and Canada in Paris. The meetings were part of the Prime Minister's diplomatic mission to Europe and free trade was top of the agenda. This comes roughly a month before the European Union member states decide whether to green light negotiations for a trade deal with New Zealand. Talks were expected to begin late last year, but the EU has yet to give the go-ahead amid concerns from countries like France about agriculture. Our political reporter, Craig McCulloch, is in Paris. The symbolism of three young leaders all in one city was not lost on the host of a town hall event where Jacinda Ardern was set to give a speech on climate change to Parisian students. Hope has sprung up again in the guise of youth. The host quipped many thought France's president Emmanuel Macron was incredibly young when he was elected last year at the age of 39. Then... You, Ms Ardern, became Prime Minister of New Zealand at the truly young age of 37. Ms Ardern doesn't share only youth with Mr Macron. They met earlier in the day for the first time at Elysee Palace and, according to the Prime Minister, were in agreement on every matter discussed. There's something about obviously having a conversation with um, a leader that's of, you know, of your generation that does make that interaction perhaps a little bit different than it otherwise might. The most notable area of agreement was trade. We have a shared common vision of what can be, what should be the new trade agreements. Emmanuel Macron speaking through a translator through his support behind beginning negotiations for a New Zealand EU trade deal. That's significant given France's traditional hesitation. French farmers worry they may end up being undercut. Another EU country could yet block the talks from getting underway at a vote next month. But Ms Ardern says she's heartened by Mr Macron's words. I certainly come away from this visit much more hopeful than perhaps when I went in. And in a last minute addition to the programme, Jacinda Ardern again crossed paths with her Canadian counterpart. Justin Trudeau was in town on the way to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in London and due to give a speech to students shortly after Ms Ardern. The two managed to squeeze in a 15 minute sit down to discuss you guessed it, their trade agenda. It'll be brief though. Not a lot of time for three elections, so we'll be on with it. As for the Young Guns moniker, Ms Ardern's not sold. I immediately thought of myself and Simon Bridges, so I think we might need to come up with a new name. The Prime Minister has now travelled to Berlin and will meet the German Chancellor Angela Merkel this evening New Zealand time. From Berlin for Checkpoint, Craig McCulloch. 17, almost 18 minutes past five. Wallabies rugby star Israel Folau says he will walk away from Australian rugby if he needs to after details emerged of his meeting with the union CEO last week. Folau, one of the game's highest profile players, replied to an Instagram question asking what's God's plan for gay people with the answer hell unless they repent of their sins and turn to God. The reaction was immediate and high volume. Qantas, the named sponsor of the Qantas Wallabies, said this sponsorship may be reviewed if more such comments were made. Falau was summoned to HQ for a please explain, a please explain, but it also seems a please pipe down. He didn't. He took to the internet with a column on the website Player's Voice saying Raylene Castle, CEO, had misrepresented his position and his comments and that she did so to appease other people. To New Zealand MPs, Lewis Wall, a former Black Fern and Silver Fern, and Marama Davidson said Falau's views put young gay people at risk. And we're going to hear later in the programme from people worried about the impact of Falau's opinion. But first, a former Wallabies coach, Alan Jones, now a radio show host in Sydney. Rugby Australia seems to think the only views that count are Qantas views. Uh, I mean, we're in desperate situations. I mean, there's a UN Declaration of Human Rights, which indicates that people are entitled to express a view. That doesn't mean to say we agree with the view. I don't agree with the view. And just as you've got to handle the consequences of the views, well, Israel's quite prepared and he's handled those things with dignity. But he's just made it clear to, to Rugby Australia that um, if the views are unacceptable, he's happy to go. Um, I find it quite extraordinary that... Many of these corporates believe they speak for the whole organisation. Don't tell me that, that, you know, Qantas, every person in Qantas agreed with same-sex marriage. They didn't. 
I don't know what Qantas and these outfits are doing getting involved in this. It's a privilege to be involved in the sponsorship of a national team. And they seem to say that, uh, well, we're entitled to a view, but you're not. What kind of world are we in? I mean, this, this is taking us back to the age of Stalin. It's a terrible setup. I mean, you're entitled. There's too many people in playing the victim card in all of this. I don't agree with what Israel has said. I'll tell you what. I've defended him to the hilt. He's entitled to his view, and he's entitled to have to live with the consequences of those views. Now, if Qantas then want to sponsor a team, but it's conditional on everybody in the team agreeing with their view, then I'll tell you what, I'd be telling Qantas to get packing. Look, Rugby Australia have gotten a clue. It, it's, it's a dysfunctional outfit. I don't know what they're about. This Whaling Castle's been appointed. It's the first big play is to call in Israel Folau. Well, and then the next big play was to race out and talk to the media. Then when she talked to the media, she didn't tell them what took place at the meeting. And Israel made it quite clear. He said, I'm not, not telling you what to do. I'm just saying that I won't be altering my views just to accommodate a sponsorship. And if that's uncomfortable for Rugby Australia, I'm prepared to go somewhere else. I mean, we are, I think we need courageous young people like this to stand up to this politically correct nonsense that you've got to you've got to agree with what everybody else says says you can only say what other people allow you to say and you're not allowed to have a different viewpoint a controversial viewpoint and every time you say something someone's going to be wounded and injured look it's time we all took a spoonful of cement and toughened up a bit i mean all sorts of things are said about all of us cop it get on with it stop playing the victim card this stuff's gone too far, and here we've got a young footballer standing up to it. I don't know what it's got to do with rugby. Standing up to what, Ellen? Sorry, I'm really confused what he's standing up to. What he said was that gay people would go to hell. In what way yeah. is that standing up for anything? He's entitled to a view. I mean, I don't agree with the view, and I've told him that. He's entitled to his view. What are we going to say? Israel. So, so hold on a sec. So I'm, I'm really interested. So he's entitled to his view until when? If his view was that he supported Adolf Hitler, to take it to an absurd extreme, but if his view was that he was a Nazi he's sympathiser... That view. He he's is, is he? So at view. what stage do we draw a line in the sand and say, actually, your view is injurious and damaging? Where do we oh, draw that line? On. Injurious and damaging to who? Most probably to himself. Come on, what world are we living in? If he wants to say the earth is flat, well, let him say the earth is flat. I mean, we've gone mad here, and people are intimidated from speaking up. And I'll give you a classic example of that. Who's intimidated, Who's intimidated from speaking up? You're not intimidated from speaking up. The people you deal with aren't intimidated from speaking up. No one's intimidated. Is anyone intimidated people from speaking are intimidated. up? People are intimidated from speaking out. Now, at the opening ceremony of the Commonwealth Games, the news reports the following day were, what a wonderful spectacle. This was brilliant. This was the rest of it. Nothing about the Gold Coast, nothing about Queensland, nothing about Australia. It was a three you know, two-and-a-half-hour history of Indigenous Australia. So I went on air and I said, well, I just thought it was appalling. I mean, it didn't represent Australia. 3% of Australians are Indigenous. There are 97 97% of others aren't. And it should have been representative of the Gold Coast of Australia. People are ringing me and saying, oh, thank God for you. I was terrified to say all that. That's exactly how I feel. And suddenly, 300,000 people on social media agreed with what I had said. But they weren't going to say it until I'd opened my mouth. We've reached the point where people are intimidated from speaking out. Now, if Israel wants to say these sorts of things and someone's injured, how the hell are they injured? I mean, people tell me every day to go to hell. And people say, them, oh, I'm sure people say terrible things about you. They've said they many terrible, terrible things. About They've said many terrible things about me. But I yeah. am a, I'm, I'm a well-paid... you take a spoonful yeah, of yeah, the no, 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 but hold, hold, no, but no one said I'm going to go to hell. I don't think anyone has said I'm going to go to hell because of my sexual orientation or because of choices I've oh, made. Oh, I, I don't know. And, 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 no, Alan, I don't want to have... And, I, 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 and, and I, this is a fascinating conversation. But, but what you are talking from, the position you're talking from, is a kind of normative occupation of uh, a whole lot of groups which don't get told they're going to hell. When was the last time someone looked at you and said, you're going to go to hell when you die? Oh, how many times, you mean? Come on. What? I mean, tough, if they said it, toughen up, John. Hey, go and take a bit of cement and toughen up and stop playing this phony, injured person. Alan, right? I'm as tough as an old the, boot, but the, I'm not a 17-year-old boy. I'm not a 17-year-old boy living people. in small-town Australia, surrounded by people who say homophobic things all the time, wondering if I dare to come out. Well... 
hang on, hang on. I think there is a general perception out there in the community that we don't care about people's sexuality or gender, and they hear that all the time. There are people standing up for that all the time, for the equality of their viewpoint, whether it's the way in which we accommodate them in schools, whether it's the bullying in schools. All all these people know that though there is nothing wrong with your stating your sexuality what you are. Nothing. Now, someone has said something entirely different. Well, me, I say, you're entitled to say that, let it go through the keeper, and you must live with the consequences of it, and he will live with the consequences of it. Just as if someone says, the earth is flat. You think, well, this bloke's a bit of a lunatic, but we don't, we don't tie ourselves in a knot over the whole thing. I mean, God, there's far more important things for Rugby Australia to be talking about than this. They're broke. They can't win a game against a New Zealand promise. And here they're buying into an argument with a player. And the player must confirm, what's next? Are we going to have a view about, you know, euthanasia? And if someone says, terrible thing to say, oh, I think my mother should be allowed to die, give her a needle. Oh, you can't do that. We don't, we don't agree with mercy killing. What, what is it? Abortion. OK, well, let's have, a, let's have a universal opinion about abortion, a universal opinion about euthanasia. And you'll all have to toe the line here or else we don't want you in the team. But this is rubbish and nonsense. Alan Jones uh, talking to us earlier, uh, a couple of hours ago, out of Sydney. 26 minutes past five, you are with Checkpoint on RNZ. Russia says international experts will be allowed to the site of a suspected chemical attack in Syria later tomorrow or Thursday. Britain and the US have accused the Russians and Syrians of tampering with the site in Duma and preventing inspectors from gathering information. Meanwhile, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has repeated Russia's assertion that the attack was staged, adding that recent events mean relations between Russia and the West and now worse than during the Cold War. The BBC's James Landale reports. The missiles launched by American, British and French forces at the weekend were aimed at Syria's suspected chemical weapons facilities. But Russia's foreign minister said the attacks on his Syrian allies had also left relations between Russia and the West worse than the Cold War. In a BBC interview, Sergei Lavrov accused the Western allies of having a phobia about Russia, which he described as genocide by sanction. We uh, lose basically the last remnants of trust to our Western friends, uh, who prefer to operate on the basis of very uh, weird logic. They punish first in Duma, in Syria, and then they wait for the inspectors of OPCW to visit the place and to inspect. But as journalists were allowed into Duma to film life returning after months of fighting, it emerged the inspectors from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons had not been allowed in for what Russian and Syrian officials said were security issues. At the OPCW headquarters in The Hague, Western diplomats accused Russia of deliberately blocking the inspectors and even tampering with the evidence, something Russian officials denied, promising the inspectors would be allowed in. We are obviously keen to make sure that the inspectors uh, have every means that they can to carry out their job and carry out their investigation as soon as possible, and we see no reason why they should not be able to get to Duma. EU foreign ministers backed the missile strikes, threatened further sanctions on Syria, but called yet again for a political solution. We're seeing more people dying, and it is true that the solution to the conflict seemed to be even more far away than ever in the past uh, more than seven years of conflict. This afternoon, Britain and the US kept up the pressure on Russia, publishing new information about what they described as a malicious cyber attack on the West. Now, security officials said this Russian campaign predated the Salisbury and Syria chemical attacks, but they said they were on high alert for possible retaliation. But for now, supporters of President Assad in Damascus are celebrating the capture of the eastern Ghouta suburb, a victory in which chemical weapons seem to have played a part. It's James Landale from the BBC. New Zealand's stance on the airstrikes against the Syrian government was, was raised directly with the French President uh, and Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern after they met in Paris. Ms Ardern has only gone as far as saying she accepts the reasoning behind the airstrikes launched by the United States, Britain and France in response to a suspected chemical weapons attack. Uh, speaking through a translator, President Emmanuel Macron first responded to a question about New Zealand's position. Je dit. On the first 
issue, as I said earlier. I thank New Zealand for its constant uh, commitment within the international coalition. We're engaged in Syria faced an, with an enemy, Daesh or ISIS, that's to say the Islamist terrorist. They're our enemy. President Macron also said he had not meant to signal the change in the U.S. position on Syria after the White House rebuffed his suggestion he'd dissuaded President Donald Trump from rapidly withdrawing American troops. I didn't say that the U.S. or the France were going to militarily remain engaged uh, over time in Syria. We have one military goal uh, in Syria and one alone, the war on ISIS. I simply said that the United States had decided with the U.K. and France to conduct a targeted operation that is not built within that setting that was the preservation in international humanitarian law. Jacinda Ardern was asked whether New Zealand would emphatically express support for the airstrikes. Of course, our first approach, as is the first approach of many countries, is to seek a multilateral mandate via the United Nations for such action. And I think that would have been the preference of many. Uh, however, the use of the veto power by Russia, something we've strongly condemned and will continue to condemn, has prevented that from being possible. Under those circumstances, we accept that uh, uh, France, the UK and the USA undertook the action they did because we cannot allow the use of chemical weapons to go without response. Uh, but I think we, we share uh, a hope and an aspiration that we will uh, now, in the wake of uh, that action, move back to the UN, seek a multilateral approach. Jacinda Ardern speaking to media in Paris. <laughs> Twenty-eight and a half to six. Thank you for being with us. Coming up on Checkpoint, the standoff between Southern Response and Hunger Striker. Peter Glasson continues. Activist Penny Bright. This is in Auckland. Launches a fundraising campaign for others to pay the rates she refuses to pay herself. What does the future hold for Wheel Clampers? Nona has business news. Quite a bit happening today, I think. And we'd love your feedback, of course. Text two one zero one. Lots of you are with very polarised views on Alan Jones. Uh, you can email Checkpoint at radioNZ.co.nz, and we are, of course, on Twitter and Facebook. But Katrina Battle before anything else has the headlines. 12,500 more people have missed out on a bowel screening program in Waitamata because of a mistake. The Health Ministry says more than 30 of those people have developed cancer. Mary Bradley of Bowel Cancer New Zealand told Checkpoint people running the, the screening pilot were not reaching all those on the list because their addresses had not been updated. She says this is worrying because such people are often those most at risk. The Christchurch minister has asked officials to get involved in a dispute between a hunger striker and the Southern Response Committee. Peter Glasson began a hunger strike this morning in front of the committee's offices over what he says is seven years of lack of action over earthquake damage to his home. The minister says there's been a bit of a stalemate and a roadblock now needs to be removed. Forrest and Bird has told the High Court it may not have had the best information available with which to give consent to mine for iron sand off the coast of Taranaki. Consent for Trans-Tasman Resources to mine the area was granted by a decision-making committee in August last year. But the Conservation Group's lawyer says endangered dolphins frequent the area and the information available may not have been enough to make the decision. One person has been seriously injured in a crash on the main highway north of Christchurch. The accident happened at about 3.40 this afternoon near Woodend and involved a truck and a car. A section of Main North Road is currently closed and diversions are in place on Pa Road and the Rangiora Woodend Road. A hearing for a conservation protection order in Golden Bay has been congratulated for achieving the first such protection for an aquifer in this country. An application that seeks to grant Te Wai Korupupu Springs the highest protection possible attracted more than 2,000 submissions, most in support. The hearing by the Environmental Protection Authority began in Takaka this afternoon. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six. Which is not very far away, 26 minutes away. Thank you. In fact, whatever it is, 26 minutes. Yes, thanks, Katrina. Are we got some quite big breaking news coming up after business with Nona. Uh, Nona, nice to have you with you, uh, us, Nona Peltier. Fletcher Building Surprise Market with a $750 million capital raising. 
and plans to sell a couple of big assets. Boy, we keep talking about Fletcher Building, don't we? Well, they're under, they are under pressure to get things right, and this might just put them on the right path. We still haven't heard exactly what they're going to do going forward because the strategic plan that they are going to announce in June is yet to be revealed. But today they did uh, put their balance sheet in order. So uh, earlier this year we heard from the new chief executive who talked about where their losses were going to be with the building and interiors business, about a billion dollars all up. How are they going to address that? They've come out today and said, okay, we're going to raise uh, money through a selling sale of shares. Those um, that, Now what they're doing is they're basically offering the shares at a, quite a good discount to the last traded price, 23%. So that kind of a, basically gives the, the existing shareholders a very strong incentive to take up this offer because if they, their share price will be diluted if they don't and it's it's quite a good deal so we did see some changes in the market today as a result of that 750 million dollars that's a lot of yeah, money a hell of a lot. Yeah. and they're gonna sell a couple of their businesses too these are their international businesses they're gonna keep the ones that are in New Zealand and Australia that's gonna be the focus of the business so that's a bit of a hint of where they're going but they're selling their roofing tile business business and their Formica business which has operations in North America, Europe and China. So that that's going, we don't know what that's going to be. It's going to take some time to sell them. Those those assets are worth a lot of money. It remains to be seen how much of that will be used to re repay debt. But in the meantime, this $750 million is going to happen this week. They're in a trading hall right now and that has had an impact on our market. We've dropped um, uh, three quarters of a percent, that's uh, 62 points. Now that's at a time when the markets generally are fairly little changed in the rest of the region. And what that is is really um, uh, analysts, uh, sorry, investors moving their money around to take advantage of this particular okay. offer. So we're seeing that in that. Uh, explains one thing. That, that, that's the markets. Just tell us what the dollar is and then we'll go and talk about the other thing. Well, the, now, interestingly, the dollar was little changed against most of its currencies, but it did change against the Brexit and that's because the pound is against, moved. Against the Brexit. Oh, sorry. Against, against the euro. Now you look what you've done. Well, today. no, it's a Freudian uh, error. Yes, it's against the pound because of the Brexit. Right. So it's the, the pound is now at the highest point it's been since the uh, referendum to uh, separate from Europe. Uh, the European Union and as a result of that now the reason you might ask is because now people think that the Brits are going to do a better deal than they expected and that the uh, European uh, so these are the same these are the same people who were in the markets predicting that Brexit wouldn't happen right these are the same <laughs> right so, the same yeah, people. how are they going reading okay, the tea and leaves? also the Bank of England may hike interest rates so that's the reason why uh, the uh, pound not the Brexit the pound has moved uh, yes so. Very quickly, because we've got a lot to jam in all of a sudden. Oh, sorry, okay. uh, new Real Estate Institute data shows prices are up, but sales are down. Yeah, well, that's the old story, just to make it very brief, and that is because we don't have enough supply in some of the key markets, and specifically Wellington. They really are struggling. Yeah. Now, we've known the story about Auckland for a while. It's starting to spread. Nona Peltier, business reporter, thank you very much indeed. This is fascinating. We're just trying to get a handle on this. And breaking news, Checkpoint understands a class action by a group of Southern Response policyholders is close to reaching an out-of-court settlement. This is in Christchurch, of course. The 26 remaining policyholders were set to go back to court as a group after arguing that the government insurer had engaged in a deliberate strategy to deceive policyholders and delay their claims. Southern Response confirmed in a statement, a settlement is close. I quote, yes, we are in discussions and we are entering the last part of that process, Southern Response will release a statement when the negotiations conclude. Now, the Office of Earthquake Recovery Minister Megan Woods told us, and again, I quote, facilitated discussions are happening around the class action and we're expecting to see good progress. So that's the Minister and Southern Response. Christchurch lawyer Grant Cameron, who is leading the class action, is the man who will definitively be able to tell us. And we're trying to reach him for comment. And the fact we can't is in itself revealing of how close this may be to a conclusion. Uh, we will update you the moment we hear more on that. Meanwhile, Minister Megan Woods has also asked for a third party to get involved in an earthquake claims dispute between Christchurch man Peter Glasson and Southern Response. Mr Glasson began a hunger strike today in front of Southern Response's Christchurch headquarters after years of fighting with the insurer to have his policy honoured. Sitting in a borrowed caravan outside the insurer's office hoping that someone, anyone from inside will come out, sit down and talk things through. Here's Logan Church. Under the blackened exterior of Southern Response's Christchurch offices, Peter Glasson has parked up his caravan and is refusing to eat. 
Peter Glasson's 1920s home, with rubble foundation, was badly damaged in the 2011 Canterbury earthquake and needs new foundations. Stocked with multivitamins and electrolytes, Mr Glasson hopes this drastic step will get everyone back around the negotiation table. We're at the end of our tether, what else can we do? We, uh, Southern Response refused to speak to us. Uh, all they do is hide behind the legal process and they say we're in court, they'll see us in court and we say to them let's resolve it, let's get round the table and resolve it. In a written statement, Southern Response's Chief Executive, Anthony Honeybone, says the organisation became aware of the issues the Glassons had with their property when they filed legal proceedings in 2016. He says mediation was attempted, but it didn't get anywhere. Southern Response has offered to actually undertake the work to repair the Glassons' house. We have, however, been unable to agree on the extent of damage and what repairs are required. Mr Honeybone says Southern Response was hoping to resolve Peter's problems through a trial last year. He says the Glassons filed extensive new evidence the day before the trial, and due to circumstances outside its control, the trial couldn't proceed. But Peter Glasson has a different story. The judge adjourned it on the, the request of Southern Response. Uh, what they did was they were late in submitting their, their largest piece of evidence, and so therefore we had to be late in submitting ours. We, the court only gave us three working days to reply to their evidence and which we asked the court to give us more time, and they said no. Um, and then the Southern Response were very, very late in submitting their engineering evidence to us, and that delayed ours to them, and then they made that an excuse as to why the court case should be delayed. In the Southern Response statement, Anthony Honeybone says the organisation wants to meet with the Glassons again. However, it won't do that until the Glassons allow its experts onto their property to assess new evidence that was filed before that trial. Southern Response has offered to meet with the Glassons as soon as we have the additional information we need from the site visit. We understand how frustrating additional visits must be, but new evidence was introduced and we need to make sure we understand how it affects settling the claim. But Peter Glasson isn't keen for more experts to visit his home. We're not actually happy about the 17 times that they've been and the court doesn't seem to realise the invasion of privacy that that entails. Um, once or twice or three times is fine, but 17 times. And these are new experts that they keep on bringing. Today, Mr Glasson called on Christchurch Regeneration Minister Megan Woods to intervene. Ms Woods says as the shareholding minister of Southern Response, she can't directly intervene. But today she says she asked Darren Wright from the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment's Residential Advisory Service to meet with PISA to find a solution. I've asked Darren to meet with Mr Gleeson around this very specific issue of what, what can we do to allow that site visit to happen. We're at a bit of a stalemate and my priority for, as Minister is to work with Southern Response and with Mr Gleeson and to see what we can do to remove that roadblock. Ms Woods says she hopes that meeting can take place in the next 24 hours. In Christchurch for Checkpoint, call Logan Church Tanay. And any update on the Southern Response uh, situation, we'll have it to you immediately. They've been described as predatory, threatening and bottom feeders. Car claiming companies are charging extortionate amounts in some cases for minor parking infringements and that needs to stop according to the government. It's considering restricting the fees they can charge, but says an outright ban on clamping may not be the solution. As Katie Doyle reports though, the AA says a ban wouldn't go far enough. Anna Lee Bamba's 71-year-old mother Lee Lene is one of the many motorists who have fallen into the clutches of car clampers, who are reportedly charging up to $700 a pop. In 2016, she says her mother popped into a Papa Toy Toy shop for five minutes to buy her son a birthday cake. When she returned, her car was clamped and a man in a black uniform was standing beside it. Ms Bamba says the man demanded her mother pay $200 to get it unclamped. When she came to enter, there was no visible signage, um, nothing in the actual car parking spaces. He did point to a sign, but it was obscured by a car that had been parked in front of it, and it's kind of like hidden in a um, little corner near the shop on a concrete pillar. Ms Bamba says her mother felt she was targeted because she was elderly and frail. She rang me when the incident happened saying that she was quite stressed and she thought she was being a target of a scam and she did feel quite intimidated because the guy was quite aggressive and threatening. 
She says clamping companies seem to target lower socioeconomic areas where people may not be fully aware of their rights. There's been a lot of discussion on Facebook with people sharing their like incidences that have happened in certain areas that are always targeted, like the food court in Manukau, general kind of parking places where a lot of people access fruit shops. Um, all across South Auckland, it's, it's been quite prominent. So is a clamp down on clamping overdue? Yes, according to those on the streets of Wellington. Jim Goodman reckons parking in big cities is hard enough without the added stress of clamping. Parking anywhere in the cities or in big towns is very expensive and, you know, clamping is even worse. So, yeah, I'd say leave the clamping alone and put in more parking places. And Lolita Soma says the method is ridiculous. I just think it's absolutely disgusting, dreadful that they do it. And are you happy that the government wants to clamp down? Absolutely. They should have done it years ago. The AA has been calling for a ban on clamping for years. Its spokesperson, Mark Stockdale, says the practice is ineffective and unfair. The penalties are excessive and it denies natural justice because you have to hand over the money to release the wheel clamp and you are unable to actually challenge whether you were wrong and whether the penalty is fair. The Consumer Affairs Minister, Chris Farfoy, says he's heard of people being charged up to $700 to get their cars unclamped, which at present is legal to do. He says the government is considering setting a cap on charges, but an outright ban is unlikely. People do have property rights. Mm -hmm. uh, if you owned um, a car park and people illegally parked there or wrongly parked there or parked there if they knew they weren't meant to, then I think you do have mm -hmm. some recourse. So getting that balance right, I think, is what we're trying to make sure we get. Car clampers themselves weren't keen to comment on the clampdown. RNZ contacted two companies but received no response from either. For Checkpoint, I'm Katie Doyle. The White House and President Donald Trump have hit back hard at the former FBI Director James Comey. During an interview to promote his new book, Mr Comey accused the President of being morally unfit for office. Mr Trump fired straight back on Twitter, accusing Mr Comey, who he sacked last year, of committing many crimes. Here's the BBC's John Sopel. Donald Trump this morning left a Washington that's been hit by flash floods and torrential rain. And last night, the former FBI Director had a bucket load of his own that he was seeking to pour over the president's head. The interview. James Comey has a book to sell, and it would seem scores to settle after the way he was unceremoniously fired. And on questions of character, he didn't pull his punches in his interview with ABC's George Stephanopoulos. I don't buy the stuff about him being mentally incompetent or early stages of dementia. He strikes me as a person of above average intelligence who's tracking conversations and knows what's going on. I don't think he's medically unfit to be president. I think he's morally unfit to be president. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage General Mike Flynn. A key episode concerns Michael Flynn, the president's first national security advisor. He was under criminal investigation for lying about his contacts with the Russians. At a one-to-one -one meeting, the FBI director alleges the president asked him to drop the case. Was President Trump obstructing justice? Possibly. I mean, it's certainly some evidence of obstruction of justice. The White House didn't wait for the interview to air before taking careful aim at the former FBI boss. James Comey continues to uh, spread false information. Uh, the guy's known to be a liar and a leaker, and so there's not a lot about James Comey that we would find to be very surprising. Undermining James Comey's credibility is deliberate strategy. If there are ever impeachment proceedings brought against Donald Trump for obstruction of justice, then the former FBI director will be a key witness. So shred his reputation now and maybe his word will count for less later on. But James Comey is only one source of the president's current legal headaches. In a courtroom in New York, the president's personal lawyer was appearing after the FBI raided his offices last week, seizing bank accounts and files. Michael Cohen was a Mr. Fix-It for the president. One of those he paid off to the tune of $130,000 was the former porn star Stormy Daniels. Her arrival in court had film crews falling over themselves. Literally. She was paid that money in return for her silence after she allegedly had a brief affair with Donald Trump, an allegation that he denies. It's hard to know which is the more dangerous to the president, James Comey and the special counsel investigation or the porn star payoff 
and the fallout from that. The BBC's John Sopel. We head now to Golden Bay at the top of the South Island, of course, where the clear, cold waters of Te Awai Korupupu Springs have welled up through the earth and out to sea for thousands of years. But there's concern the country's largest freshwater springs are under threat from increased demand from commercial mining and irrigation users. Now a special conservation order is being sought, which if granted would give the springs the highest protection possible. Our reporter Tracy Neal went to the springs ahead of the start of the Environmental Protection Authority tribunal hearing today. A bright green and blue garden shimmers from the depth of the largest cold water springs in the southern hemisphere. Andrew Yule, who teamed up with a Golden Bay iwi, Natitama, to apply for the water conservation order, describes the first time he saw Te Waikoropupu Springs. Slightly elusive, a kind of presence. There was just a sense of an enormous power that is lifting up such a huge amount of water. I mean, later on we started putting numbers to it and it's a truckload every second. But it was doing it silently and with a grace and it was lifting it from some completely unknown, invisible depth. And, of course, the almost bewitching clarity of the water. So far, water conservation orders have only ever applied to rivers, but this application is for an aquifer that supplies the springs. Sharon Campbell is one of the 95% of 2,000-plus submitters who support it. They actually need to be protected by all New Zealanders, otherwise we're going to lose them. More than half of all submissions came via an online tool set up by Forest and Bird. Debs Martin from the conservation group says it was a good way to capture people's stories. And we wanted to set up a, a tool that would allow people from across the country to easily be able to just put their thoughts down about how they felt about it and their, um, their connections to there. And the stories have been really quite compelling. You know, it is an incredibly important water body in the eyes of New Zealanders. A water conservation order would not affect existing consents which relate mainly to irrigation. No one currently bottles water from the springs but several companies are interested. Debs Martin is worried about the lack of hard data about human impact on the springs. There's lots of conceptual modelling and there's been an increasing intensification of land use in areas near to the springs as well as proposals, you know, way upstream. And our understanding of, of how that's all managed is something that's been brewing along for quite a long time really. Most want the springs and systems that feed them protected because of their cultural and historical significance. Others want the rights of existing farmers and commercial operators protected. A water conservation order can prohibit or restrict new water and discharge permits from being issued by regional councils. A small number like the Iwi Authority for Ngāti Rārua, one of three Golden Bay Mohua Iwi, don't support the conservation order at all. Te Runanga or Ngāti Rārua Chair Olivia Hall says it doesn't feel an order would go far enough. We would much prefer to see a model like Whanganui River had, which is Te Awatupua. It's actually a Māori-based model where uh, iwi are given a lot more rights and standing, as well as the actual water body would be given uh, legal rights as a person. Andrew Yule says protecting the water and the rare plant and animal species that live in them is a small part of a bigger picture. This is perhaps one of the abiding treasures which is coming to us through this collaboration between myself and Ngati Tama because some kind of understanding of how to live sustainably in our world is something that society really badly needs right at the moment. The hearing is scheduled to run for three and a half weeks. The tribunal will then prepare a report that either includes a draft water conservation order or a recommendation that the application be declined. E Mohua Moti Hotaka Oti Ahi Ahi Koa Tracy Neil Dene. The Minister in Charge of Housing New Zealand has labelled its actions petty and vindictive after it took a pensioner to the Tenancy Tribunal and lost. 
over a small table outside her front door. Vivian Wright has had the small table for a decade without issue. Her cat uses it to come and go, but when her body corporate manager decided he didn't want it there anymore, instead of ticking, sticking up for its tenant, Housing New Zealand took her to the Tenancy Tribunal. That confused almost everyone, including the tribunal's adjudicator. Zach Fleming with a story about a table, a tenant, and perhaps in a way the future of mixed housing in Auckland. For Vivian Wright, it was about the principle. I got an in breach of tenancy notification and I seriously nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> Jesus. Facing potential eviction for a small, we're talking the length of an average forearm, faux marble table that has sat outside the front door of her second story flat in Freemans Bay in central Auckland for the past decade. It's unobtrusive, unobstructive. She put it there as a way for her cat, Scudamoosh the Black Prince, to come and go. There's also some small pot plants scattered around the table. Housing New Zealand asked for those to go too. They have condoned this table being here for over 10 years and suddenly it's upsetting Stephen Connolly and the body corp and it has to go and, and I refused. All Housing New Zealand, Vivian's landlord, had to do was read the body corporate fine print to see she wasn't breaking any rules. But it didn't. It instead took the body corporate manager Stephen Connolly's word that she, a 66-year-old pensioner with chronic fatigue syndrome, was in the wrong and took her to the tenancy tribunal. It was seven and a half months of, of feeling dispossessed, feeling persecuted. In December last year, the tribunal's adjudicator thought the whole thing ridiculous and gave Housing New Zealand a free out, saying there was no evidence Vivian had done anything wrong. Neighbour Zyman Mock was there taking notes. At the preliminary hearing, she was sitting there going, what am I not getting? Why, why is this case before me? There's something else going on here. The confusion may have been in part because nobody except Mr Connolly has any issue with the table. I asked Miss Mock if it's ever bothered her. No. <laughs> but Housing New Zealand didn't take the easy out. Instead, it doubled down and postponed until February. The still confused adjudicator again sided with Vivian. Her table is here to stay, with the backing of the Minister for Housing. He did say that he found that the actions against us by Housing New Zealand, he found them petty and vindictive, and he said his vision for Housing New Zealand as a landlord was to be responsive and compassionate and to treat the tenants with dignity. And was he implying that in this case they weren't responsive or compassionate? I think you could take that. Yeah, he was quite horrified. Phil Twyford said he's happy with that account of their conversation. Petty and vindictive. Mr Twyford declined to be interviewed, saying it's inappropriate to comment on operational matters, but talking generally, he said in a statement that he's confident Housing New Zealand Chief Executive Andrew McKenzie fully understands the need for the organisation to be a compassionate landlord for its tenants, who are some of New Zealand's most vulnerable people. Body Corporate Manager Stephen Connolly and Housing New Zealand Chief Executive Mr McKenzie both declined to be interviewed as well, but a Housing New Zealand spokesperson said it was obligated to take Vivian to the tribunal. We are happy with the Tenancy Tribunal's decision. We think it makes sense. However, there was an obligation on us to follow the direction of the body corporate in the first place, as we are subject to its conditions and must balance the needs of tenants with the requirements of being a property owner in a body corporate situation. And that's the big issue here. Is taking tenants to court the best way to balance those needs and at what cost? What is Housing New Zealand going to do in the future, given most of Auckland's new housing developments are terraced apartments, where there will be a mix of private and Housing New Zealand tenants? And how is it going to be managed? How is the governance going to work? Is Housing New Zealand going to stand up and represent its tenants in, in like body court committees? Because at the moment, Housing New Zealand is their only representative on the body court but they're not representing them at all. You know, there's no system in place um, for them to consult with tenants, to bring their concerns forward. They're really only acting as a kind of a punitive master, telling them when they're doing things wrong and dragging them to tribunal over the most trivial nonsense. One idea floated in Miss Wright and Mr Twyford's conversation was an independent ombudsman type service where tenants can go to settle petty disputes, like whether an outdoor table is okay, and maybe a directive from the minister in charge. We have to solve it through institutional change and guarantees for housing New Zealand tenants. And I think it's really important to think about for, you know, all the thousands of new developments and houses in, that are going to be built in Auckland over the next 20 years. How, are, um, how is Housing New Zealand going to actually represent its tenants? 
An answer to that question is what Vivian wants most from this ordeal, but she'd also like her legal fees paid too. There's a culture in Housing New Zealand that bears looking at, bears scrutiny, because it should be protecting, supporting, empowering the communities of tenants rather than treating them like second-class citizens, and that's how we feel. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. It's so about 40 seconds before the news at six. Feedback is extraordinary tonight. Half of you are saying, get Alan Jones off your radio station. And about half of you are saying, yes, I agree with Alan Jones, and thank goodness he's saying it. Whew. And uh, the other half of you, which is one and a half of you, uh, are saying, what happened to Mark Middleton? Because we did Mark Middleton last night and his case with Immigration New Zealand. Well, there is still no response from either Immigration New Zealand or the Minister. And of course, because if you know us, you know that we are tenacious and singular. We are asking. We will update you the moment we know anything at six o'clock. RNZ News at 6. Ngā mihi nui, good evening. Ko Katrina Batanaho. A group for bowel cancer patients says the Ministry of Health was warned that people eligible for a screening pilot couldn't be found because addresses weren't up to date. The ministry's revealed today that about 12,500 Waitamata residents didn't get invitations to be checked for the cancer between 2011 and last year. That's on top of 2,500 residents who also missed out when they weren't contacted because of a technical error. 30 of the largest group have, have since developed cancer, adding to the three in the smaller group, one of whom has died. Mary Bradley from Bowel Cancer New Zealand told Checkpoint emails between those running the pilot and the ministry show there were concerns about tracking people through their addresses. People that don't have updated addresses are uh, people that can't afford to go to the doctor, are uh, people of Māori um, descent that don't necessarily uh, get to their doctor either. You know, it's an equity issue, and they're the ones that, are, that desperately need the screening that aren't getting it. Mary Bradley says many people won't know they've missed out on the screening. The Health Minister, David Clark, declined to be interviewed, but in a statement he says it's disappointing and concerning that so many people have missed out on being invited to be screened. He says the latest issue emerged after his decision to call for an independent review of the National Bowel Cancer Screening Programme and vindicated that call. Dr Clark says screening saves lives and it's important people have confidence in the national programme. A teenage daughter whose mother pimped her out for sex as much as five times a day says all she ever wanted was a, her mother to love her. Kismia Lata blackmailed her 15-year-old daughter into working as a prostitute for 18 months until late 2016. She's been sentenced to six years and 11 months imprisonment after pleading guilty to dealing in slaves and sexually exploiting and receiving earnings from commercial sexual services provided by an underage person. In the High Court in Auckland today, the Crown Prosecutor, Natalie Walker, said this case was gross offending of the most exploitative kind. She read out the teenager's victim impact statement, which said she was deeply betrayed. I felt like my mum treated me like a piece of paper that was just being used. I don't have any family left now. My brothers blame me for what has happened to mum. I've always loved you, mum, but I couldn't get over that. All I wanted was your love when I was a child, teenager and as your girl. Hundreds of Crown Prosecutor Natalie Walker. The government has intervened to try to resolve a quake claim dispute that's triggered a hunger strike. Christchurch man Peter Glasson began a hunger strike today in front of the Southern Responses offices after years of fighting with the government owned insurer. Mr Glasson has refused Southern Response's latest request to visit his property, saying it has already done so 17 times. The Minister for Greater Christchurch Regeneration, Megan Woods, says she's asked Darren Wright from the government's residential advisory service to meet with Mr Glasson to find a solution. Ms Woods hopes they can meet within 24 hours. In the Syrian capital Damascus, large crowds have been rallying in support of the President Bashar al-Assad as chemical weapons inspectors prepare to visit the site of an apparent chemical weapons attack in the nearby town of Douma. Duma itself is occupied by government forces, supported by the Russian military, who are reported to be patrolling the streets. The BBC's Lise Doucette is in Damascus. Hundreds of Syrians flooded the central square in Damascus today, <laughs> shouting, we salute the army. It's a show of defiance after last week's missile strikes by Britain, the United States and France. 
It's also a tribute to the Syrian military's most recent victory. Days ago, the last rebel-held enclave in the capital, eastern Ghouta, was finally recaptured. This victory, at the moment of Western airstrikes, has only hardened President Assad's resolve to win this war on the battlefield, not at the negotiating table. Les Doucet reporting. The Prime Minister plans to ask the German Chancellor Angela Merkel for her perspective on the recent military action in Syria when they meet for the first time this evening. She'll meet the so-called Queen of the European Union for the first time over an hour-long lunch. Our political reporter Craig McCulloch is in Berlin. The United States, Britain and France have launched airstrikes in response to a suspected chemical weapons attack. But Ms Ardern has not unequivocally supported them. She's only gone as far as saying she accepts the reasons for the action. Ms Ardern says she expects tonight's discussion to cover similar ground as her meeting with the French President Emmanuel Macron in Paris last night. She says she'll also thank Ms Merkel for Germany's long-time support for New Zealand entering trade talks with the European Union. From Berlin, Craig McCulloch. The government has set up an expert committee to advise it on whether farmers should start paying for their greenhouse gas emissions and also how the country can achieve totally renewable power generation. The Interim Climate Change Committee will investigate how New Zealand will transition to a net zero emissions economy by 2050. It will begin the groundwork for the Climate Change Commission to be set up next year. It's five and a half past six. Sport, the England netball captain and Northern Stars recruit Ama Abaiswi believes Birmingham will put on a great Commonwealth Games in 2022. Abaiswi led her side to an historic gold medal on the Gold Coast at the weekend. Birmingham was only confirmed as the 2022 hosts in December after the Games Federation took the event away from Durban. The city already has 90% of the venues needed, but needs upgrading with the costs expected to be a billion dollars. Abezwi says she feels the Games will benefit her hometown. I've been just talking to the general public and volunteers, and usually I go around Birmingham and no one even looks at me. So <laughs> if it can bring the city together just because of the Games, then I think that's a bonus for Birmingham. Ama Abezwi. Meanwhile, in light of the Silver Ferns' disappointing Commonwealth Games campaign, Netball New Zealand CEO Jenny Wiley has confirmed that a review will be conducted soon with the findings to be presented to the Netball New Zealand board in early June. The New Zealand Warriors coach Stephen Kearney has named veteran Simon Mannering in the starting lineup for the first time this season to face the NRL leaders the Dragons on Friday night. With Leivaha Pula forced to the sidelines after sustaining a foot injury in last week's first loss of the season to the Broncos, Mannering will take Pulu's place on the left edge. Warriors centre Solomon Okata was seen carried off the field last week with ankle trouble but has been named to start pending a fitness test. That's the news. I'm ready now, would you please the annual Tate Music Prize is New Zealand's highly coveted award recognising outstanding creativity in an album. It's taking place tonight from 7pm and RNZ will be streaming the whole thing live at rnz.co.nz slash music. This year's finalists include Aldous Harding, Nadia Reid, Teeks, Phaser Days, Grayson Gilmore, Kane Strang, My Maidens and The Bads. Also on the night, the Headless Chickens will be accepting the Classic Album Award for their groundbreaking 1988 record, Stunt Clown. Join me, Alex Behan, tonight from 7pm for the 2018 Tate Music Prize. Just head to rnz.co.nz slash music. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland to Waikato, also Coromandel and Bay of Plenty. Fine spells and isolated showers, but rain for a time this afternoon and evening, with isolated thunderstorms possible about Northland and Auckland. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, mostly fine with isolated showers. Waitomo to Wellington and Wairarapa, including the central high country. Occasional showers, but rain for a time this afternoon. Northwest gales about Wellington and Wairarapa easing this evening. Marlborough and Nelson showers clearing this afternoon and becoming mainly fine, showers returning for a time overnight. Buller to Fiordland, periods of rain or showers with possible thunderstorms and hail today, clearing in parts of Westland tomorrow. Canterbury to Southland, mainly fine, a few showers in Southland, spreading north for a time today and early tomorrow. And for the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods with a period of rain tomorrow morning. It's almost nine minutes past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten, and thank you everyone for being with us. Uh, 
This has been a big issue in the past year or two, and this is accidents involving foreign drivers, tourist drivers on the wrong side of the road. A man severely injured in a head-on car crash in Northland says he has met the tourists driving the car involved and has forgiven them, but still wants their passports confiscated and charges laid. Peter Birchall, his wife Jali and friend Robin are recovering in hospital after the car, driven by the tourists on the wrong side of the road. Uh, collided with his at Waipapa Cody, north of Kaitaia, on Friday. Mr. Birchall, who works as a tour guide, wants better road markings. More arrows reminding people what side of the road they should be on, particularly in remote tourist spots. A computer test at rental car offices and harsher penalties for visiting drivers who cause accidents. This afternoon, I asked Peter what he remembers about the crash. I drove round the corner, the last corner, before you hit the last... 1K to the beach in my house. I drove round the corner and I saw this red car right there driving our way. Not coming across, right there outside of the road driving our way. All I remember I did, and Robin believes I did it too, is I pulled the steering wheel left. Their reaction, because they come from the other side, the country that drives on the other side, was to pull right. Hence, when you look at the photograph, we are not on the road. Had they pulled left, we would have still hit, I might have been killed. But maybe we would have got away with a side swipe. But all I remember, Jelly is having bad nightmares now. There's somebody in there talking to us, seeing what they can do now, psychologist. So the person who was driving towards you was on... Was totally just on our side of the road. As, as, just as I, you and I drive down the road, except they were driving the wrong way down the road. You've met them. You've totally. met that driver, haven't you, subsequently? When did that happen? When did that meeting happen? Ten minutes ago. And what was that like? She would not look at us, but her friend along... They are two doors along from us in the hospital. And I didn't know who was driving in their car because one had got out, badly injured, no English... So I went, I'd already assessed all ours, and I was the one called Triple One, and I've got my medical certificate, just done a two-day course. So I assessed them and told the next first person, I've not touched that car, they cannot be moved. But I don't know who was driving. To me, it didn't look like they had seatbelts on, but maybe they'd already unclipped them. I don't know. I don't know. But today, at our request, they didn't know we were going to come in. Jelly and I went in there. Jelly talk Chinese. We gave him a bottle of 15 plus Manuka honey because we've had some dropped off at our door. Um, and said, We are not angry. We, and, they, and the woman that would talk to us, the driver wouldn't look at us. She knew she was hearing all this in Mandarin. She cried. She was so grateful. She was, smiled. And she was just so happy that we're all alive and that we had done this. Um, and now they will feel much happier knowing that we hold no blame. It is not their fault. It's our system, that whatever it is. Um, and hopefully we've made two people, one of them is still severely ill, hopefully we've made them happy. And it's made our hearts feel better. What charges meantime, should people face, Peter, in these circumstances? When they should charge the maximum time, have the maximum charge possible thrown at them, as fast as possible. The passports confiscated, and they should be forced to stay here and take this court case. If they must go to prison, go to prison. Yes, we're going to be thousands and thousands of dollars out of the pocket. We don't know when we can either of us can work again. But that driver, regardless. Of you know, of our New Zealand law situation must be held responsible. Must be. The public out there must know that these people, our system, will actually hold them to account. Right now, the police told me on Friday when I was with Jelly and all in Wangari uh, Kaitaia before we, we were helicoptered down, um, told me they don't know what to charge them with because they won't come back for the court case if they've left the country. If they confiscate the passport, if there's no border control, and they might get another one and still go. They don't know. And most, this is what's happening, most are not coming back for the court cases. We must make sure they must be charged. 
as New Zealanders, we would be. So how okay. do we get this right? How do we, given that tourism is up there alongside dairy as our number one earner of foreign exchange, how do we encourage people to come, make okay. them welcome, okay. give them the quintessential New Zealand experience, which includes going into the middle of nowhere, and keep them and everyone else safe on the roads? OK. Immediately, I am a member of Pro Guides, the Professional Guide Association in New Zealand. You grab all people like us, the rental car companies, but mostly those of us that are actually driving all the time. Put us in a forum and have a bloody great headbanging session. I don't have the answers. I know there should be white arrows at Waipapa Carry Ramp. I know my thoughts that I think overseas drivers need some sort of computer test to me. That They have to pass not a road code, one designed for international drivers coming here. And that should be rental car companies hooked back to a government computer. If they cannot get 90% or 95%, they cannot rent that car. The virtual speaking from hospital uh, in Northland. It's quarter past six. The Inspector General of Intelligence and Security has set up an advisory group that contains two journalists. They are New Zealand Herald reporter David Fisher and hit and run co-author investigative journalist Nikki Hager. The minister responsible for New Zealand's spy agencies, Andrew Little, says it's somewhat surprising, but the journalists will have to manage their own potential conflicts of interest. He says the 11-member group will act as a sounding board for the Inspector General, Cheryl Gwynne, but won't be privy to classified information or operational details of the SIS or GCSB. Andrew Little was asked how the reference group will work. She's gone out and got, in, in addition to you know what you might describe as orthodox voices, some otherwise pretty challenging and sceptical voices. I think that's a healthy thing. I, I think we've got to accept that like any, any government department, but particularly those who are required to operate in secrecy, it's not a bad thing to have some scepticism and some dissent as we you know, seek to achieve the best level of oversight for those agencies. Does this group have any authority other than advice to the Inspector General? No, they don't. The, I mean, the Inspector General is the one who is, you know, receives complaints about the organisations, she provides oversight for the organisations, she makes rulings about the actions that they've taken. She is the ultimate authority. She can have a reference group, but they, they cannot be involved in and won't be involved in her rulings. Yeah, so what sort of security clearance does that group have? Because this is 11 members. How much information are they privy to? Well, they, they're not there to make judgment calls on the operations of the organisation and indeed on, on what particular operations are entered into. They are there to provide, as I understand it, a level of principled input, if you like, um, making sure that the values of the organisations that the Inspector General um, believes they should be working to are uh, sort of maintained and observed. Andrew Little speaking to reporters at Parliament. Auckland activist Penny Bright has raised more than $7,000 via a Give Little page to pay $20,000 of rates that she's refused to pay herself. Her million dollar property in Kingsland, it's a central city suburb near Eden Park, has been listed for mortgagee sale to pay for rents, rates the self-titled anti-corruption whistleblower owes to the Auckland Council. Ms Bright is confident she'll meet her donations target but is adamant she won't pay up until the council opens its books and shows greater transparency. Here's to Manu Kōtehi reporter John Boynton. For the last 11 years, Penny Bright has refused to pay her rates over what she describes as a lack of transparency around Auckland Council contracts. With her school road property in Kingsland listed for sale, with tenders closing in a week, she is now turning to her supporters to help raise funds. A Give a Little page set up last week has already raised more than $7,000. I hope to have raised the $21,000 and the 20000 for outstanding rates will then go into a solicitor's account where that money will be held in escrow. Last month, the High Court ruled Penny Bright's property would be sold to recover more than $30,000 in unpaid rates and penalty fees. Miss Bright says she'll hold $20,000 in an account for up to a year and will pay her rates bill when Auckland Council meets her demands. What? I'm seeking, as I have been from day one, is to get the key details of awarded contracts published on the websites of Auckland Council and Auckland Council controlled organisations so they're available for public scrutiny. Insolvency specialist Damien Grant has donated $1,000 towards Penny Bright's rates bill. I don't think that she should pay her rates. Penny Bright is making a stand for something that she believes in. It's a 
hard principled road that she is taking. I hope that enough other people like me put their hand in their pocket and get her over the line. Mr Grant does pay his own rates, but he begs Miss Bright's choice not to. If you have no problem with the way Auckland Council is running its services, if you believe that Auckland Council is doing a great job and it's doing everything that's meant to do and you are happy with it, then by all means, pay your rates. But Penny doesn't believe that. However, Penny Bright's Kingsland neighbours aren't so supportive. The ones I spoke to say it's time she paid up. She needs to do what every other Aucklander does, is pay their own rates. No good asking others to do it. Everyone has their own bills and stuff to pay, and if she has the means to pay for it, why not? I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's kind of weird to say I'm, I'm quite pro-tax and I'm, I'm pro-rates and all that sort of stuff because I, I do see the value in what the government and the council do. If she's just going, no, nah, I'm not going to pay them, I would kind of like, OK, that's your stance, you're not paying them, they don't need to be paid for whatever reason, but if you're then trying to get money for other people to pay them for you, I feel that's a bit rich. The tender for Miss Bright's three-bedroom, one-bathroom property closes next Tuesday afternoon. Mo te hōtaka o te ahi pōnei, ko John Boynton aho. Wallopi's rugby star Israel Folau has made the bombshell revelation that he would walk away from Australian rugby immediately if asked to, while also accusing the code's chief executive, Raylene Castle, of misrepresenting his position and comments during a media conference. The rugby star hit the headlines after his controversial comments on Instagram, uh, asked about homosexuality and God's plan for gay people. He said hell unless they repent. And yesterday the website Players Voice published a column written by Falau called I'm a Sinner Too, in which he elaborated on his comments and the meeting with his rugby bosses. Shannon Honui thompson has more. In his column for the Players Voice website posted online last night, Israel Falau said he told Australian rugby bosses during their meeting it was never his intention to hurt anyone with his Instagram comment, but that he could never shy away from who he is or what he believes. Falau said he did not want to bring hurt to the game and wants as many people playing as possible. He said this was the reason he spoke to Australian rugby CEO Raylene Castle about walking away, writing it was to help the game, not harm it. Australian rugby wasn't talking today, but in a statement, Miss Castle said... She was satisfied with his respectful way in which he clarified his comments and would not take action against him. Last week, Miss Castle said she was in negotiations with Falau to extend his contract and wanted him to stay with Australian rugby. To us, he's a great player. He's you know delivered some great outcomes for us and you know has been a really uh, strong role model, model in the Pacifica community. Um, and we would like to see that he stays in rugby. And it's these talents which could also be Falau's saving grace, despite the possibility of a showdown with sponsors like Qantas, who said it found his social media posts disappointing. Massey University's Head of Public Relations, Dr Chris Galloway, says it's a wise decision by Australian rugby not to cut him loose over these comments. If he demonstrates that um, regardless of the views that he holds on this matter, that his on-field performance continues to be strong, then my hope for him would be, and I think Australian rugby is probably calculating, that people may be prepared to um, forgive a degree of intemperateness um, as long as he does what he's uh, hired to do on the rugby field. But Alex Kins, who's a player and committee member for the gay rugby team New Zealand Falcons, says Falau's comments are detrimental to rugby, which he believes should be appealing to everyone. It's a shame because he's essentially a role model and the scope of his outbursts that can have quite a significant um, damage to the confidence and mental well-being to those who are maybe struggling with their sexual identity, especially in the youth. We're trying to build a positive message so giving Falau this kind of forum to speak out about this kind of stuff is it's just damaging to what the whole rugby culture is about, really. Israel Falau's wife and silver fern, Maria Falau, has posted in support of her husband on her Instagram, saying, stand with God no matter what. Don't be afraid to stand up for the truth, even if that means you will be standing alone. Mo te hōtaka o te ahipōnei, ko Shannon Hainui Thompson aho.
A youth convicted of burglary and drug offences has received a top award while serving his sentence behind bars. He and 10 other young inmates from Christchurch's men's prison were recognised today for their success in the Duke of Edinburgh Hillary Awards, a programme which involves completing challenges that teach new skills, including leadership, goal setting and decision making. The Corrections Department hopes learning these skills will ensure the young men don't return to prison once they're released. Maya Burry reports. At an awards ceremony at Christchurch Men's Prison today, 11 youth offenders were recognised for completing challenges as part of the Hillary Award, a programme which has been offered to those in the prison's youth unit since 2016. Recent challenges for the inmates included running a full marathon, which added up to 19 laps around the prison complex, completing a tramp, and camping out in the prison yard. One 20-year-old offender who took part, and who RNZ News can't name, says he ended up in prison serving a three-year sentence for drug and burglary offences after hanging out with the wrong people led him down the wrong path. It's hard because I try and block everything out that I have done out there, but um, there's some parts that I don't want to block out. It feels like I've been here for about 20 years, you know, it's been a while. The 20-year-old offender received a gold award at the ceremony, making him the first prisoner in New Zealand to achieve this level while behind bars. He says the programme has taught him new skills and challenged him to think differently. The 20-year-old says that's important because he doesn't want to return to prison. Oh, very important because um, if I come back, I'm going to lose my family. And they've told me this, you know, I've had this last chance and I can't break it. You know, I'm too scared to, you know. I'm scared to get out in case something does happen or I get pull, pulled into the wrong, wrong people. But, you know, I've got the rest of my life ahead of me and, yeah, can I look forward to eh? Christchurch Men's Prison's youth facility is home to 34 young men at the moment. The only other facility of this kind is in Hawke's Bay. They are watched over by the youth unit's principal corrections officer, Gary Smallridge. Mr Smallridge says the level of offending of those who stay at the unit varies from young men who have committed car conversions and minor thefts to more serious crimes including murder. One of the big major things at the moment is aggravated robberies and that's most of them, you know, I think, oh look, we're out of cigarettes, let's go down to the dairy and just take some, you know, and not thinking of consequences and things. And, and just the ones that we get in here that have sort of just mixed up on what they've been smoking and drinking. And it's usually like after two weeks we get to know who they are and they start to come out. They're only kids that have just been lost. Gary Smallridge says he's very proud of those who participated in the challenges, which are optional, and he is always hopeful the men coming through his unit will be successful outside of prison. They leave here good kids, but sober kids, but a lot of them are going out and trying their hardest, you know, but they'll go around to their mates and they're smoking something, so, oh, you know. And, and one kid went home and said, hey, I'm, I'm on conditions, I can't smoke. So they said, well, sniff fly spray, that... That works, you know, and it's just dumb stuff. They're still kids, you know, so we really need that support to get around the kids and, and just keep them safe. The Corrections Minister, Calvin Davis, attended the awards ceremony. He says programmes like these are an important part of trying to reduce reoffending rates and ultimately the prison muster. Stopping reoffending is, is essential. Um, also reintegration into communities is, uh, is just as essential. Uh, most importantly though, we've got to uh, make sure that people don't go into prison in the first place and that's the, that's the real challenge ahead of us. The Corrections Department is in negotiations to offer the opportunity for prisoners to take part in the awards challenges in six other correction facilities around New Zealand. In Christchurch for Checkpoint, Maya Burry. Just before we move on, Maya Burry is a, a brilliant young uh, newcomer to RNZ and she has uh, been acknowledged as a finalist in the New Zealand Radio Awards and we're really proud of you, Maya. Maya and her colleague Logan Church, who's also in Christchurch, are both out of the Christchurch Broadcasting School just a year or two in the business. Fantastic additions to the RNZ team and we're delighted to have them both and we're delighted and proud, Maya, that you've been acknowledged. I want to say also that Checkpoint is a finalist in the Best Daily or Weekly Program category and our boss, Pip Keen, and we're just going to have a shot of her. Kelvin, bang, there she is sitting at her desk looking extremely annoyed that I did that. Turning her back to the camera is the finalist in the producer category 
and we are delighted and proud and you richly deserve it, Pip. It's 28 and a half past six. Lots of feedback tonight. Sorry, John. Alan Jones is finally speaking some bloody sense. No one's allowed an opposing opinion anymore. I'm saying that because there's lots of exclamation marks. As you said, harden up. Love your programme. This is polarised, Alan Jones. Good on you, John. Entitlement to free speech, yes, but when it causes hurt to people, and in particular a minority that have been victimised for years, then no, it's not OK. And those two are fairly opposite takes on Alan Jones and the interview. Pretty representative of a 50-50 split. Well said, Alan Jones. Finally, some common sense. Says this person, Sue says, though, where is the orderly queue for me to give Alan Jones a spoon? of cement. Thank you. We really appreciate your feedback. Lots of people also saying when you are in the middle of nowhere in New Zealand there are no reminders what side of the road you should be on and if tourists are going to come here and by golly they are in great numbers and they are going to go on roadies and of course they do and why wouldn't you? We've all been on roadies when we've gone on trips then we need to remind them, particularly in remote tour spots where they leave a picnic zone or a loo or a beach or whatever and go back onto an empty road, what sort, also what side of the road they should be on and you're all saying more arrows, more arrows. Thank you for your feedback, we really appreciate it, thank you for your company. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us, it's coming up to 6.30, um, Katrina's next, we'll be back tomorrow at 5.00. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. RNZ News understands an out-of-court settlement is close between Southern Response and 26 policyholders taking a class action against it. A group for bowel cancer sufferers says the 15,000 Waitamata people who missed out on screening were often those most at risk. The teenage daughter of a woman convicted of using her as a sex slave says she feels deeply betrayed. And the government's investigating whether farmers should start paying for their greenhouse gas emissions. Our next news and weather is at 7. Death is real. Last year, Phil Elverham, who records his Mount Airy, released one of the most starkly personal documents of grief ever put on disc. Now he's made a sequel. I'm Nick Bollinger and I'll be discussing Mount Airy's Now Only in the Sampler. I'll be reviewing an album of Bob Dylan songs by soul veteran Betty LeVette and something unexpected from Mr Dylan himself. 